And 15 years later, you're in the house and your wife asking you, is it ready yet? And you're like, I'm still working on it. <laughs> so for thousands of years, God using a screwdriver called Israel to fix whatever the fall of man did from Eden. And he's still working on it. And he's God. And the tool of Israel that he's using, he had to throw it out in the garbage, basically kick them into captivity and said, you're not working right. The screwdriver doesn't work right. Tell me at what point. If he never proved that he can solve the problem after Eden, tell me at what point he proved that he's going to solve your slavery. Untenable means being such that defense or maintenance is impossible. An untenable position. My lesson is titled, Torah is Untenable. Look at these verses here that I'll open with. Ezekiel chapter 11 verse 12. Thus shall ye know that I am the Lord. For ye have not walked in my statutes, nor have you executed my ordinances, but have acted according to the ordinances of the nations around you. So there goes the scripture that says, Ye are my witnesses. So now... If he puts you into captivity, then that only solidifies you being like the nations around you because now you will live like them and so on. Now there is no one to reflect the Most High. So he has, in a sense, no witnesses. I was always thinking that you will be his witnesses because when he resurrects his nation, everybody will know. But it seems at least that while that is based on prophecy that is yet to come, there is no way for us to prove that until it comes. Therefore, I am left to understand that while the supposed prophecy is being expected he has no witnesses you'll say to me oh but other prophecies already fulfilled say that we'll be in slave lands and people will be taking advantage of us slavery and so on so that proves him but I wonder how kosher is it to use, close your ears now if you don't like something rude. Just close your ears for maybe 30 seconds. But how kosher is it for the slimy, dirty, algae growing food and gravy and maggots and so on at the bottom of a three or four year garbage can not cleaned how kosher is it that that stuff laying at the bottom that makes it so stink in the garbage bin how is it that that kind of stuff in a spiritual way witnesses of God how can that be a witness of God you know, the cleanliness and the purity of God with his priests, high priests dressed all in white. When the sin and the transgression of Israel, whose garments are like filthy garments, not washed worse than the three or four year garbage can not cleaned, smells just as stink or even worse in the nostrils of the God of Israel. How does the nastiness, pardon me, of Israel, not trying to be offensive to anyone, I just want you to think of the 
kind of point I'm trying to make. How is it that sin and transgression witnesses of the pure creator Yahweh, the God of the Hebrews? Be holy even as I am holy, but the dirty filth is a witness of him. For so it says here in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 10, Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant in who uh, my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me, and understand that I am he before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. Notice what the text is saying. My servant whom I have chosen that ye may know and believe me. Chosen that ye may know and believe me. So when Israel has the uncleanness of the gods of the other nations and their rituals and practices that are not set apart, they are no longer knowing him and believing him so they are not separated unto righteousness and purity. They are a transgressing nation. So the witness is a witness because they know what happened. They know the spiritual transaction that happened to quote-unquote purchase them from Egyptian bondage or from the foundation of the world, if you want to put it that way. So to be a witness, one has to know and believe. Now, is the filthiness of Israel the way to know and believe the sanctity and the purity of all the laws and commandments of the pure God, who is the God of Jacob. So in that broken slave condition, is Israel a homeboy a slave? He's telling you, get up. Consider, are you a slave? Why? Because as long as you are a slave, you cannot be his witnesses. Because the witness is not operating based on slave mentality. Ye are my witnesses, that ye may know and believe me. But just something to think about. So another verse now, Psalm 46, 10. Cease striving and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. He's not exalted among the nations. He's not exalted in the earth. Look at all the laws that are being passed in just about every country and how and how people are living and all the other laws that you say and keep reporting on that they are making up to do even more unjust, ungodly things on earth. Never mind the wars that are about to come which will show that there is no God of love that we are experiencing in this life. Now do these things make Torah untenable? When people can attack the Torah based on all these things happening in the world that God made? Or do these things make the Torah be verified? See, if you have war and fighting breaking out in your house, and then the mother is in the kitchen concocting some poisonous stuff in the pot, the way you have poisonous medications or what they call it, um, biological warfare to poison people and so on. And then the father is in the garage trying to do something to the car to make it not run as reliable as possible. And then one child is hacking away at the wall with knives that he's throwing at the wall like darts because he's playing a game and he thinks it's fun. And then you get the daughter. She's doing something else to the house, whatever she's doing, and the nail polish and everything all over the carpet and the wall and the counter is staining up everything. That's bringing down the condition of the house. And then you get the cousin in the house doing something else that's not good for the house, will devalue the property. And there's just chaos in the house, there's fighting and everything. 
and uh, the only thing missing out of that house is the actual physical manifestation of a tenant called the devil. Because everybody else seems to be living in there already. How does that prove and verify the Torah or verify God living in that house? But Israel is the chosen people of God. In a book that I'm telling you is untenable, but it says, ye are my witnesses. Tell your neighbor to come to that house and find the love of the Lord Jesus. Or if you're more into the Hebrew Torah, tell them to come and find out God's plan for their life and that they're Hebrew as well, or they can just be a stranger passing through your house. Will they find God in that kind of house? Or are they going to be walking through looking for the devil? He must be in the bathroom because the devil cannot possibly be absent from this house. How does that house be a witness? So how is Israel a witness in slave lands, eating unkosher food, corrupting the body, destroying the mind with the rituals and practices of whatever is in slave lands, breaking all kinds of Torah rules that nobody else should be ruling over you. How is that a witness and a word from God? Or do these things make people attack the Torah? Even Gentiles are attacking the Torah and saying the Bible is fake and so on, the Old Testament is fake, the New Testament is fake, there is no God, stuff like that. But should I come back to untenable? Right? Because it says here, when you deal with untenable, it is such that defense or maintenance is possible. How do you maintain, how do you keep the Torah online in a condition like this, not just a condition of the world like we're seeing, but the condition of Israel? Israel backstabbing each other, Israel carrying on, and even the book itself says, a sword will not depart from your house. What kind of a witness is this where God kills his own people and puts a sword right there? You see, it's coming on to me more and more that the Torah is just simply using concepts that were already on earth, but a very nice religious slash spiritual story was made of it jam-packed with some real history that happened on earth. Because it's saying here that if it's untenable, defense is impossible. People are attacking the stuff. And after all this time, people cannot stop the attack against the Torah. That's because the Torah does not have anything in it to prevent such attacks. It cannot silence people. So you wait on a prophecy to silence people. Now I don't mind a prophecy silencing people in the end, but in the meantime you gotta accept that the Torah, while you wait for the prophecy, is under attack and cannot prevent attack and is suffering attack. It's suffering damage. You can say, but science says this and science says that and the Torah proves that because the Torah said that before we knew that about science. But the Torah, with all its science, is still under attack. Defense is impossible. Now let's look at defense. Action of guarding or shielding from attack or injury. Act of defending by fighting. A fortified place of refuge. And I'm saying to you, the Torah is incapable of finding refuge in the face of all these things that people out there who both believe in and don't believe in the Bible are bringing up against it. It cannot prevent itself. Let me give you an, I uh, an idea of what I mean. Because you say, yeah, well, people can always continue to find problems with the Bible, especially if they don't even believe the Bible. Maybe the person who believes it, like you, just lost your mind, but maybe the person who doesn't believe it, they just simply don't understand, period. So we can see them complaining. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fix up your complaining problem when you say people can complain. Because I don't see how people can complain about the word of God. See, when you're expert teacher or pastor or you're more ray, 
gives a nice Sabbath teaching or a Sunday teaching, you say, oh, well, there, now we understand. So people stop complaining about this or that doctrine because now everybody in the church or in the Sabbath meeting now understands. They've been brought up to the level of understanding. They know what the Hebrew words mean or the Greek words mean. Oh, now, now, now we understand. So everybody, whew, and they go home. But notice that the Bible never gets to that point where people says, whew, and Gentiles stop complaining. But every time you hear another person writing a book or something and they keep complaining, why? Because no religious teacher of the Torah or the New Testament ever gives anything to shut up the people complaining about the Torah. The Torah is untenable. I know I'm messing with you, but I just got to look at it different. Because, like I said, the moment I saw while investigating the sacrificial system that God of the Torah could not have commanded people through Noah to eat meat. And if you want to eat meat, that's your business. You do whatever you want. You're still going to die if you don't eat meat because vegetarians die as well and so on. So whatever you want to do, I just know that based on the things I'm learning these days, it seems... A, a better experience on earth mentally spiritually to me and from what I can tell in the environment in the earth if people did not start eating meat that's just my feeling on the matter but I also see that the Torah does not allow the meat to be eaten so if you are a Bible believing person I don't see why you're eating the meat, especially as a Hebrew Israelite, having your lamb and your goats and whatever you're eating, your bull, before the Lord. When, like a flesh-eating zombie straight out of a zombie movie, but instead of eating the people, you're eating the bulls and the animals, with the flesh hanging down from your mouth like you're in a movie. When, uh, you're eating that before the Lord. When that Lord told you the food you should eat, comes from the trees and grows out of the earth. But the very instruction of righteousness to eat the stuff that comes out of the ground, the greeneries, that very instruction was overturned in a ritual to offer animal sacrifices to the Most High and eat them before His presence on high holy days. So that he gives an instruction saying, eat the fruit and so on from the earth. And then the audacity of the Israelites says, I'm going to rip my teeth into that bull or that lamb and eat it right before you, O Lord God of Israel. And you're telling me something is not wrong with the mind of the Hebrew Israelite? You transgress against a very commandment he gave from the start while you become an expert in so-called later given commandments while you're breaking one of the very first ones eat from these trees Exodus 6 7 then I will take you for my people and I will be your God and you shall know that I am the Lord your God does God feel like your God today? Or do you just feel like the Torah is yours? Because there's a difference. See, we as slaves have come to replace the Most High being our God and feeling like He's our God and knowing that He's our God with knowing that the book is ours. Something is wrong with your mind. Your God has been replaced with your book that you say is yours. You see that? You've given up the real thing for the book about the thing. Exodus 7, 5 The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand on Egypt and bring out the sons of Israel from their midst. So the only time you can know or prove this God 
And the only time his witnesses can be seen as witnesses of him is when the witnesses come out of Egypt or come out of bondage. Until you get free from your bondage in 2018, no Egyptian is going to know that you are serving the Lord and that the Lord is yours and that he is your God. A book cannot prove he is your God. It is deliverance that actually proves that. So prophecy in waiting does not prove anything about your relationship to God, your status with him, your righteousness. It doesn't prove that. All that proves is that you are, or helps to prove is that these are things you believe as you read. But if there is no proof as yet, because he has not yet acted with a deliverance to move you out of bondage into freedom, then there is no proof. And if there is no proof, how is it that ye are my witnesses? Because deliverance precedes the status of a witness. The witness can never be a witness of until he is a witness of the deliverance provided by. I don't know. I'll just move on. Exodus 14, 18. Then the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I am honored through Pharaoh, through his chariots and his horsemen. So what he's saying is that I can't even be seen as your God until I get this honor from defeating Pharaoh with his chariots and his horsemen. Until your enemy is defeated, your God has no honor. If your God is not honored, how in the world can you dream of honor yourself? Is that the people talking about Jesus, Jesus, Jesus is going to do for them when he comes back? He was already here and he never did anything. Israelites running from Romans in the time of AD 70 and so on. He never did anything to save them then, so they were killed, slaughtered, and the rest of them ran into other parts of Africa. So they never saw him do anything, but they're still waiting for him to do something in the future. That's a messed up mind. So here is it again, Exodus 7, 17. Thus says the Lord, by this you shall know that I am the Lord. You see how many times I'm reading these scriptures that says, know that I am the Lord, know that I am the Lord? Because God cannot be unknown. It's like when they say when you come to see something, you, you become aware, you're awake, you're now awake and so on. Um, it's like you can't go back to sleep, that kind of talk. How can Israel know that I am the Lord? But an enemy nation comes and takes you into captivity and you unknow the Lord. You see, the captivities in the Bible, like, it's telling you that Israelites, they would like do the stuff of the other nations, so they started to transgress. But then they were doing their own stuff as well, because they would go and do stuff with the other nations, but then they would come back and do the regular Sabbath. So they were keeping it. But he just says you profaned it because you're not ready for this. You're not doing it properly. You're mingling other stuff with it and so on. Or you do your pagan rituals first and then you do mine after. Stuff like that. But they were still knowing the Lord. They, 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 they always were aware of what they should do even if they weren't doing it properly. That's why he could say put away your evil. Why? Because there was a basis, a substratum of the real thing, of the truth that was there, of the Torah. They were just doing some other stuff that they shouldn't do. That's why a prophet could rise up and prophesy the error of their ways and they could say, wow, yeah, it's true. Well, even if they didn't like it and they wanted to kill the prophet, they could still acknowledge because even that they wanted to kill him knows that, let you know that they still knew the right way. So the right way was always with them. They knew. So the, the, the Torah is telling me that the right way was always with Israel, even if they didn't know it perfectly, but they still knew it a lot, a whole lot. Like when Josiah found the book of the law, it's like 
it's not like they didn't know anything about the Lord anymore. They were still doing the rituals and the holy days and so on. But it just wasn't as perfect as. So they still knew it. So now, how is it that in your captivity now, in modern times here, you don't know the Lord, period, until an enemy nation teaches you the law? In modern times here, you don't know the Lord, period, until an enemy nation teaches you the law. Until an enemy nation teaches you the law. Where do you learn most of your law from? Is it from Hebrew Israelites? I'm talking about the first ones of them, the early ones that, you know, is it from them? And all the black African rabbis from Nigeria and so on that you all have seen the videos already. But you got Israelites cussing them out, saying that they're up Nigerians are Africans. But you get an African. So, but 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 in general, most of the books you buy, aren't you learning from somebody that is not a Negro? People not set apart, who are your conquerors, have taught you the law of the Lord your God and continue to teach you that. And your books are mainly by them to learn the Torah. And you can know the Lord based on that. You think a Jewish rabbi in the land of Israel will let you teach him mainstream and teach his household the Torah? Even if you've been teaching the Torah now for 10-15 years? But the Israelite, the black man, the black woman, you buy another book and you learn from them and it's their websites you use and so on. But yet, you're going to know the Lord. I, I didn't intend to trouble you today, but, you know, sometimes we're just in so much denial of the facts that are right before us. That you are rising back up in the presence of the Lord, in the knowledge of the Lord God of the Hebrews. And that rise is powered by your enemy. Who provided slave ships for you and ran slavery through and so on. And they are the one who actually brings you back unto God. And you believe that Torah in the same way as it's been taught to you? Can't you see something is wrong? How can the Lord in the book tell you that because you forsake his Torah, he's going to send you into captivity and put you under the hand of enemies? And the enemies never had power over you all along until you rejected the Torah. But now... The enemies just do whatever to you, beat you up and so on for hundreds of years, 400 years or whatever you want to say, and more for the other captivities. And that enemy knows that the only time they had power over you was because you rejected the Torah. And then the enemy just now in, in the last 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years just gives you back the Torah so that you can be empowered. Which one of these nations are going to find out the military um, strategies and secrets for another country that they're trying to fight and then just turn around and give them more military secrets and give them their own military secrets as well so that the enemy is on equal footing with them or greater. But your enemy took you into captivity and then gives you back the power book that makes sure you are no longer in captivity. And you don't see this is a catch-22? You are so caught away in a rapture of the Hebrew Torah words, even the Paleo-Hebrew, that you never heard Moses speak. That you cannot see the witchcraft in a book telling you that you will know the Lord only by what he does. Yet you take the knowledge of or the knowing of the Lord from people who you say are your enemies who took you into captivity. Something is wrong with that. See, I'm not doing this because I'm trying to go to hell. I'm looking for God. If he exists, he'd better find a way to teach me his Torah because I'm not learning it from anybody anymore. Certainly not from my enemy. Most Torah books on earth are not provided by the Negro who says they are the Hebrew Israelites. So who are you learning it from?
So are you knowing the Lord by a divine or one-on-one -on -one or a direct interaction between you and the Lord? Or is there a middle man in between that's causing you to know the Lord by teaching you? Through their books, through their websites, and through their videos and so on. Exodus 10 verse 2, And that you may tell in the hearing of your son and of your grandson how I... Not somebody else, a third party doing it for me to let you know that I am the Lord. But how I did it myself, how I made a mockery of the Egyptians and how I performed my signs among them that you may know that I am the Lord. So the Lord is telling you that everything that culminates in you knowing that he is the Lord is done, is carried out, is executed by him directly. Nobody else. Even in the story with Moses, whether you believe Moses is real or not or whatever the deal is, when it came time, he did not send somebody from Mesopotamia or somebody from Persia or somewhere else that is not an Israelite to come and tell Moses the message that he should deliver the church of Israel. He did not send some pagan witch worker or so, whatever you call them, over work or whatever, to teach him how to pick up snakes. The Most High in the text did it himself directly with Moses. What's that in your hand? Throw it down on the ground. Now pick it up. He did it directly and then sent Moses directly. Can you imagine if the Most High didn't do that with Moses, but instead of sending Moses to Egypt, he sent the Philistines to the children of Israel, Philistines going in there to try to talk to the children of Israel in bondage, saying, the Lord wants you to know that you are Israel and he's going to deliver you. It's weird. It's weird. But that's what you're doing today and you don't want to think about it because you say, I don't believe the Torah anymore. Ezekiel 37 verse 13 And ye shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves. Again, the proof is that he does something. So until your so-called prophecy comes, and I'm not telling you prophecy is not going to come to pass. I'm just saying until it comes, you do not know who this God of the Torah is. You just simply believe something because somebody told you and he has never done a single thing for you. Never. Because you eat food in the mornings, you get rain, well, the Gentiles get the same. And some of them got more money than you do. Joel 3 and verse 17. So shall ye know that I am the Lord your God, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Then shall Jerusalem be holy, and there shall no strangers pass through her anymore. See, this is something that God's doing. Because we know the book of Joel deals with the the, the whole resurrection of the Israelite in terms of restoration, I should say. So when I say now the Torah is untenable, is it under attack and cannot be defended? Sure. Because you can never defend against these things. Yeah, sure, you're going to quote some scriptures and have some responses, some answers. But it doesn't solve anything like the pastor in the Bible study or the Moray teacher in the Sabbath meeting can answer the questions based on the Hebrew words and let you understand. And then you go and say, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, now I understand. But after someone asks questions like these that I'm asking and statements like these that I'm making in this lesson, how many people are going to go home? After hearing these kinds of things, they say, oh, yeah, yeah, now I, okay, now, now I understand, yeah, the Torah is fine. No, they'll just go home saying, this is a problem. 
They're still going to come to your church service or your Sabbath meeting, but they know in their mind there are some questions. The Torah teacher, as skilled as he is, 95 years old, cannot answer. Because the Torah is untenable, incapable of being defended. Nothing can be done to defend this. Because something is wrong with the book somewhere. Final point to close out this. I'll prove to you in another way with the Garden of Eden that the Torah is really untenable, not able to be defended. With all the prophecies and whatever teachings and Hebrew words there are that teach the stuff from the Torah, the God of the Hebrews in the Torah ran into problems before he was, uh, once he became known as the God of the Hebrews or the God of the Israelites. Because that God is being brought to us by the Torah as the creator. And when he did his stuff initially, there was just the Garden of Eden and things were peaceful and nice. You see, up until the point when the serpent was there and people said, well, the serpent took them down and they fell and so on, one has to figure out how did this problem happen, how can we get back? The problem is that the, this same God became the God of the Hebrews and he ran into problems now when he took on the Hebrews or the Israelites because he made a move to take on the children of Israel as his own and never solved the problem of Eden. But it's going to solve your problem in captivity. Well, tell me how much more time you're going to wait for that solving. Tell me at what point. If he never proved that he can solve the problem after Eden, tell me at what point he proved that he's going to solve your slavery. So this supposed God has Eden run down and when he makes a move to fix the problem it's Israel that he sets up and no fixing of earth has happened after all these thousands of years of choosing Israel you get a tool to fix tighten something in your car and 15 years later you're in the house and your wife asking you is it ready yet and you're like I'm still working on it <laughs> So for thousands of years, God using a screwdriver called Israel to fix whatever the fall of man did from Eden. And he's still working on it. And he's God. And the tool of Israel that he's using, he had to throw it out in the garbage, basically kick them into captivity and said, you're not working right. The screwdriver doesn't work right. And then he says, you are my witnesses. So basically, the 15-year husband with the screwdriver he's saying the screwdriver is a witness is proof that I can fix this stuff but for 15 years he's been turning the same screwdriver is there a witness there of what he can do of his ability to fix that problem the fix that the most I had to Eden we were told erroneously deceptively so was to set up a nation called Israel, a chosen people. And more wars have continued to be fought on earth and people slaughtered and killed since there was an Israel since biblical times up until now. What did the nation of Israel fix? Even Israelites were killing each other. What did they fix? Don't eat from the fruit of that tree or you will die. But Death is the curse, but Israelites themselves are in the Bible killing each other, perpetuating the curse of death. What did the Most High do with setting up an Israel? When Israel loves death itself, that even the prophets looking at them saying they're dwelling in the congregation of death. And this is a smart God. So if he is fixing the problem of 
You see, and that's another problem too. They tell us that the problem here in the Torah is that Israel needs to be returned, resurrected, come to the Lord. They need to be returned to the land and, and uh, resurrected spiritually and so on. When somehow they pull something over our eyes, because if you're reading the book, if you believe the book, then the real problem on earth is not the nation of Israel. It is what happened in the garden. That is the main problem to be fixed according to the book. But they made us feel like Israel was the problem. The problem that showed a person a book was not that the nation of Israel fell, but it's that Adam and Eve fell in the garden. And he doesn't do anything to solve the problem with Adam and Eve. What he does is set up a nation and then they fall and then he says, look, I'm going to solve this problem. And for those of you who believe in New Testament, you say he's solving it by sending Jesus and he's going to come back. Or if you don't believe in New Testament, you say he, Israel fell and he's going to solve the problem of Israel by sending them into captivity and then taking them out of the captivity and restoring them. When the original problem has not been solved, because after Israel is restored, according to quote-unquote black Hebrew belief and teaching, then you still got a problem with the Garden of Eden because earth is still going to be having a problem because even in the wilderness people are going to be killed according to Hebrew Israelite teachings and even after that people are still going to be killed and drought upon people in Egypt and whoever if they don't come to Jerusalem to sacrifice before the Lord and so on so 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 even after restoration of Israel there's still going to be problems on earth but the book gives me a picture that it paints that says in Eden prior to the fall no problems were on earth. God hasn't fixed a damn thing. The Torah is untenable. God hasn't fixed a damn thing. The Torah is untenable. Once something goes wrong, Yahweh cannot fix it. That is proof. The book shows me that he is pulling something over our eyes and telling us Israel that needs to be fixed when Adam and Eve was what needed to be fixed because they fell in garden. So the whole earth fell in Eden, if I can put it that way. But he's only trying to save Israel. Shouldn't he be trying to save earth?